Um, so this is sort of the condensed version of a, a critical thesis that I did on the evolution of Little Red Riding Hood as she's been told from a medieval folk tale, oral tale, throughout the centuries um, via literature, film, and song for the most part. And this is sort of, you know, again, it, it's not covering everything that I covered in the actual thesis. Um, so I think I just will dive into it. Once upon a time, tales were spun by women doing women's work. Tales told to counteract the tedium of chores and to provide escape from the everyday through fantasy. And one such story from medieval Europe is known as the grandmother's tale. In many ways, this was the first version of the fairy tale we know of today as Little Red Riding Hood. Today I'm here to show you how I not only use this fairy tale as the basic frame for my debut novel, which we'll talk about way later, but how I also tracked this archetypal figure and her evolution from prey to predator. As Red traveled from her folklore genesis into the 20th century via literature, song, and film, her story changes as it is influenced by the needs of the time, the culture, and the genre. While this thesis traces the origins of the tale and covers the standard versions of Charles Perrault and the Brothers Grimm, it also focuses on some of the contemporary variants of the past century. Red in her rite of passage comes full circle, transcending the tale to represent feminine ideologies <clears throat> pertinent to the time in which she is being written and rewritten. So in front of you, you have a version of the grandmother's tale, which was the original medieval folk tale, and I'll, you can read along with me. So, the grandmother's tale. Okay. There was once a woman who had some bread, and she said to her daughter, take this hot loaf and bottle of milk to your granny. The little girl set off at the crossroads. She met a bazoo, which is a werewolf. Where are you going? I'm taking a hot loaf of bread and a bottle of milk to my granny's. Which path are you taking, said the bazoo, the path of the needles or the path of the pins? This is something we'll explore further. The path of needles, said the little girl. Well, then I'll take the path of the pins. Mm. The little girl amused herself picking up needles. Meanwhile, the bazoo arrived at her grandmother's, killed her, put some of her flesh in the pantry and a bottle of her blood on the shelf. The girl arrived and knocked on the door. Push the door, said the bazoo. It's closed with a wet straw. Hello, Granny. I'm bringing you a hot loaf and a bottle of milk. Put them in the pantry. Eat the meat that's there and drink the bottle of wine on the shelf. Oh, <laughs> As she ate, a little cat said, she is a slut who eats the flesh and drinks the blood of her granny. Undress, my child, said the bazoo, and come to bed beside me. Where should I put my apron? Throw it on the fire, my child. You won't be needing it anymore. And she asked where to put the other garments, the bodice, the dress, the skirt, and the stockings, and each time the wolf replied, Throw them in the fire, my child. You won't be needing them anymore. <laughs> oh, Granny, how hairy you are. It is to keep me warmer, my child. Oh, Granny, those long nails you have to scratch me better, my child. Oh, Granny, what big shoulders you have. All the better to carry firewood, my child. Oh, Granny, what big ears you have. All the better to hear you with, my child. Oh, Granny, what a big mouth you have. All the better to eat you with, my child. Oh, Granny, I need to go badly. Let me go outside. Do it in the bed, my child. No, Granny, I want to go outside. All right, but don't stay long. The bazoo tied a woolen string to her foot and let her go out. And when the little girl was outside, she tied the end of the string to a big plum in the tree, big plum tree in the yard. The bazoo became impatient and said, are you making a load out there? Are you shitting a load? When he realized that no one answered him, he jumped out of bed and saw that the little girl had escaped. He followed her, but he arrived at her house just at the moment that she was safely inside. <laughs> so in some of the traditional versions, she, the wolf actually pursues her, and she runs, and she comes upon a river where women are doing laundry, 
and they tie sheets together to form a bridge for her to cross across the river. And then when the wolf comes along, he asks them to do the same for her, for, you know. And they do, but they drop him in the river and he drowns. But the main point here is that she saves herself. So if you, um, as you can see, in this old wives' tale, Red is both a cannibal and werewolf prey, but she is also a girl clever enough to escape on her own. Unfortunately, this all changes in 1697 when Charles Perrault comes along and plucks Red from the realm of folklore and is coincidentally the first to cloak her with her namesake Red Hood, which Little Red Riding Hood expert Catherine Orenstein explains was the color of scandal and blood, suggesting the girl's sin and foreshadowing her fatal fate. While it was a cautionary tale of sorts before, Perot made it into one of morality too. So if you look at the very back of the handout, um, the tale is somewhat the same. But on page three, we see that we go through the all the better to hear you with, my dear, and then all the better to eat you up. At that, the wicked wolf threw himself upon Little Red Riding Hood and gobbled her up too. So she's dead. End of story. And we get a moral. Children, especially pretty, nicely brought up young ladies, ought never to talk to strangers. If they are foolish enough to do so, they should not be surprised if some greedy wolf consumes them, elegant red riding hoods and all. Now there are real wolves with hairy pelts and enormous teeth, but also wolves who seem perfectly charming, sweet-natured and obliging who pursue young girls in the street and pay them the most flattering attentions. Unfortunately, these smooth-tongued, smooth-pelted wolves are the most dangerous beasts of all. So I think one of the things that's important to note is the bourgeois setting of the bedchamber. We're no longer really in a European hut. Um, and that reflects the fact that Perot was actually living in the court of the Sun King at the time where he had been commissioned to work. Mm -hmm. So, while the Brothers Grimm might have saved Red from death in the 19th century with their retelling, they nonetheless further diminished her by introducing a human male character. The savior woodcutter who, by rescuing Red, magnifies her powerlessness within a patriarchal paradigm. Red struggles with her femme fatale typecasting and as she moves into the 20th century begins to reclaim herself as the Artemis slash Diana, she who runs with wolves type. As is customary with any progression, the tale plateaus and Red backtracks, but finally, pumped with teen angst and new menses, Red employs old wife wisdom to not only usurp the role of predator, but to turn the once predator into her prey. In the Oxford Companion to Fairy Tales, Jack Zipes finds the tendency to equate the documented existence of an individual motif with the contemporaneous presence of an entire fairy tale as being sometimes problematic. Following his methodology, I only looked at contemporary retellings where three or more motifs were told that came from the original. I'd like to begin by examining how the tale of Little Red Riding Hood was already different from its companion fairy tales. So you can pass this around and look at it. While parallels can be drawn between Little Red Riding Hood and Hansel and Gretel, there are key differences. Mainly that Red leaves her home willingly, as stated by child psychologist Bruno Bettelheim, and that her home is one of, of, of abundance from which the child extends to the grandmother by way of what she carries in her basket. That said, Little Red Riding Hood is unique in how her story strays from the marriage-centric, human-cast fairy tales commonly told alongside her story, such as Cinderella, Snow White, Sleeping Beauty, and even Beauty and the Beast. These tales all display the prince's trophy and the wedding as saving force, neither of which feature into Little Red Riding Hood. In fact, until the Brothers Grimm came along with their happy ending via the heroic woodcutter, no human males ever featured in the script except arguably the man inside the wolf. 
Of course, in both the genesis of Little Red Riding Hood and on other occasions, the wolf slash werewolf is understood to signify a male figure, especially the type a good girl should avoid. Orenstein points out that we still use the term wolf to mean a man who chases women. Even when the wolf successfully disguises himself as suitor slash consort, he is far from genteel. Despite the illustrations of him sporting a dandy's cane and fine top hat, or even as he literally assumes the human male form, as in the short story Where Are You Going, Where Have You Been by Joyce Carol Oates, which we'll talk about later, and the films Freeway and Hard Candy that we will also explore later, his fur tufts out and his veins seem to be coursing with lust and violence. When Red encounters a werewolf who asks whether she will take the path of pins or the path of needles, fairy tale scholar Jack Zipes writes that the maiden chooses the latter and continues on her way while the werewolf disappears and rushes to the grandmother's house. While he does indeed eat the old woman, he saves some of her flesh and blood, putting the first into a dish and the second into a bottle. By literally consuming her matriarch, Red is literally becoming her in a sacred rite of feminine communion. Winling points out that cloth and cloth making was a constant part of women's labor prior to the 20th century, and that it is small wonder that needles, pins, spindles, and other symbols of women's work frequent fairy tales, and that some folklorists attach no more significance to this to the two different paths than this. However, Terry Winling then references an essay by the French folklorist Yvon Verdier, who extensively researched traditions and rituals specific to rural women in remote, remote areas of France. Verdier's path led to a village practice in which pubescent girls were spent, sent to spend one winter with a local seamstress. This apprenticeship marked the passage from child to woman and appeared to have less to do with sewing than with refining herself. To complete this ceremonial entry into maidenhood, along with the winter, the girl also had to turn 15 and then be consecrated by St. Catherine. Only after these rites were performed was she permitted to begin courting. It appears the pin symbolized this transition to womanhood as it was by offering girls dozens of pins that boys formerly paid court to them, whereas girls assured themselves sweethearts by throwing pins into fountains. If this is indeed the origin in which the tale points, then the theory that Little Red Riding Hood is not geared toward marriage no longer stands. However, the tale would still be different from the previously mentioned companion text, Cinderella, Snow White, Sleeping Beauty, etc., and that the human characters are wholly female. Furthermore, one must keep in mind that the women telling this story would have undergone the same rites of passages themselves. The different versions may simply reflect the various storytellers' attitudes regarding their individual experiences about marriage. In fact, it is possible that the grandmother's tale may have served collectively as a fantasy in which they wondered what it would have been like not to marry, or at least for that not to have been the only option. Because prostitutes in some parts of Europe wore needles on their sleeves to advertise their profession, the path of pins has been interpreted to mean the route toward maidenhood, while needles implied sexual maturity, suggesting the heroine who chooses this path is trying to grow up a bit too quickly. Bettelheim reports evidence of yet another reading that by choosing the path of the pins, red is being lazy, as it is much harder labor to sew than it is to pin together, and thus the rather simplistic understanding is that red is behaving in accordance with the pleasure principle rather than the reality principle the situation requires. To complicate matters further, other folklore scholars interpret the choice between paths as a nonsense question, a false choice for both are equally prickly, and therefore a deliberate absurdity. Bettelheim writes that fairy stories speak to our conscious and unconscious, and therefore do not need to avoid contradictions since they easily coexist in our shadow selves. What appears to have been overlooked in the debate over the symbolic significance of pins versus needles is that in this ancient version, Red, by way of her own free will, is the complete master of her destiny. Furthermore, her fate is generally the same no matter the path that she chose. In his book Why Fairy Tales Stick, Jack Zipes 
deconstructs the changes Perot made. Zipes writes, first she is donned with a red hat, a chaperone making her into a type of bourgeois girl tainted with sin, sense red like the scarlet letter A recalls the devil in heresy. Zipes also notes that she makes a type of contract with the wolf, and because Christianity was the dominant religion in Europe, the reader realizes that the wolf also signifies Satan, and that this motif is the classic pact between the devil and mortal. Zipes concludes that the story of Red is about rape and the survival or non-survival of the rape victim. He places blame on both Perot and the Brothers Grimm for planting this germ, reminding his reader that once upon a time it was just a simple oral folktale marking the passage from child to woman. While Red eventually finds her way out of this rape victim role, Perot is in his literary casting of her has nonetheless done a, a irrevocable damage. In fact, once the contemporary works of the 20th century are examined, it will become clear that in many ways, molestation or full-fledged rape, pedophiliac, incestuous, or otherwise, is another marker for the transition from girl to woman as acculturated by a misogynistic society. Today, as we know, one in four women will experience sexual violence, a statistic that only reflects what rape cases and sexual violent cases that are actually reported. While Perot may have cloaked red and red for reasons pertinent to court life, even in the grandmother's tale, the reader sees the vivid color in red's act of cannibalism as she consumes the flesh and blood of her matriarch. The same color association occurs when one hears the title The Bloody Chamber, a collection of fairy tales published in 1979, appropriated and reconstructed by Angela Carter. It is of interest that blood is only red when it appears outside the body, that is, generally speaking, when it is cause for alarm. The only exception would be in the case of menstruation, a bleeding which does not imply injury or impending death, but rather the opposite. Menarchy, as in a girl's first period, is key to Little Red Riding Hood as a rite of passage swollen literally with the possibility of new life. Carter's The Bloody Chamber concludes with a trilogy of wolf stories that pay homage to Little Red Riding Hood. These stories are titled The Werewolf, The Company of Wolves, thank you, and Wolf Alice. But because of time, we will only look at The Company of Wolves because it was also made into a film. It is, however, important to note that in Carter's collection of reimagined fairy tales, Little Red Riding Hood is the only fairy tale she tells more than once, specifically three times as if to pay homage to the triple goddess archetype of maiden, mother, and crone who populate the tale. And again, the Brothers Grimm did the two different versions of Little Red Riding Hood as well. The motif of Men Archie continues to be explored in Carter's adaptations of Little Red Riding Hood. All three of the Carter tales appeared to be narrated by an old wife and take place in a northern country that is as perpetually cold as the hearts of the superstitious people who populate it. A landscape lifted from the Middle Ages where witches join the devil to feast on graveyard corpses. I'm glad that went down with the dessert. In the company of wolves, the heroine has just started her woman's bleeding when she's set off into the woods during the worst time in all the year for wolves, wearing a scarlet shawl her grandmother made for her. Orenstein quotes the psychologist Eric Fromm, who simplified the following motifs. The red cap symbolized the onset of menstruation, the heroine's bottle of wine symbolized her virginity, and the stones which she later sews into the wolf's belly symbolized sterility. This story ends with red bedding down with the wolf. Red is shown here to have a rebellious streak. She is challenging her fate. In 1984, The Company of Wolves was adapted into a film of the same name. The project was a symbiosis between the director Neil Jordan and Carter herself. When Granny repeatedly warns her granddaughter Rosaline that the worst kind of wolves are hairy on the inside or to never trust a man whose eyebrows meet in the middle, <laughs> it is understood that she is referring to werewolves. 
The film does not share the same ending as the short story, and Carter publicly expressed how upset she was because it was not as it had been scripted. While Rosaline is tender to the werewolf slash wolf at the end of the film, she does nothing more than tame the beast and does not appear to become anything other than perhaps sexually awakened. On the contrary, in the story version, Red becomes a werewolf. She took off her scarlet shawl, the color of poppies, the color of sacrifice, the color of her menses, and since her fear did her no good, she ceased to be afraid. She also threw those into the fire. Continuing, Carter demonstrates that Red is ready to change, to become, and by casting the shawl and her other clothes into the fire, in the striptease, striptease motif we've come to see from the grandmother's tale, she forever denounces her humanness. This transformation could also be seen as a metaphor pointing at red sh shift from child to woman. Nonetheless, it is imperative to remember that a woman's menses mimic the cycles of a werewolf or vice versa, as both occur once a month and or can be affected by the phases of the moon. Generally speaking, it is implied and or assumed that because of her age, ranging anywhere from 5 to 15 years old, Red is a virgin. Informing Prose's version of Little Red Riding Hood is an understanding of the value of the aristocratic virgin who would have come with a hefty dowry. <laughs> This demonstrates the limited feminine ideologies of the time, as in the pure and good compared to the temptress femme fatale type. Pro makes a powerful statement about what becomes of the latter when he kills off Red. The Red who appears is the character Connie in the short story Where Are You Going, Where Have You Been by Joyce Carol Oates, serves as a cautionary tale of what might happen to more teen girls in 20th century and 21st century America if the culture does not eradicate patriarchal practices. While this story was written in 1966, before Carter's retellings, its world is contemporary and therefore must be examined after. Unlike the previously explored works, Where Are You Going, Where Have You Been is not an obvious retelling of Little Red Riding Hood, although there are more than enough reoccurring motifs for it to count. The title, Where Are You Going, Where Have You Been, is reminiscent of the theme of Little Red Riding Hood, as in the implication of a path and of what we know as a becoming narrative. And like the French girls who were sent to live with a seamstress, Connie is also 15. Furthermore, she is blonde like the red of the traditional Perot and Grimm fairy tales and appears to be questioning who she is. And like red is now generally accused of doing, Connie is trying to grow up too fast. The path, of course, has been modernized. A highway separating the shopping mall and movie theater where Connie's parents allow her to go with friends from the drive-in restaurant on the other side where the college kids hang out and where she is not permitted to go. Connie, like Red, disobeys her mother and strays from the path or rather runs across it to a world where she has yet to belong. It is there that she meets the big bad wolf, or in this case, a man named Arnold Friend. If you remove the R's from his name, it becomes an old fiend. Like Carter, there are many ways to read Oates' villain. He could be the wolf or the devil, or simply a very human serial killer. What is clear is his fixation on the girl. It is difficult to sympathize with Connie. In the 1985 film version titled Smooth Talk, actor Laura Dern is exceptional at playing her. Connie is the epitome of a stereotypical teenage girl, self-absorbed, naive, stubborn, and vain, and these are the very characteristics that make the adults in her life cringe and keep their distance. And all of this plays a role in Connie's demise, another girl caught in the trap of the femme fatale. Arnold Friend with his shaggy hair and unshaven face, he's with the sunglasses in the background, is wolf-like indeed. His nose is described as long as he sniffs at Connie as if she were a treat he was going to gobble up. 
As he attempts to balance himself in his scuffed black boots, it appears that, quote, his feet did not go all the way down, and that the boots must have been stuffed with something, as if his feet were more cloven than human. He speaks in incantations, arriving to kidnap Connie as soon as she is seemingly entered into a fairyland or trance-like state while suntanning in the backyard. Daydreaming, she, quote, suddenly opened her eyes and hardly knew where she was, with the backyard running off into the weeds in a fence-like line of trees. This image from Oates recalls Carter's description of the forest in the Company of Wolves, where there are, quote, portals between the great pines, where the shaggy branches tangle about you, trapping the unwary traveler in nets as if the vegetation itself were in plot with the wolves who live there, end quote. Arnold, like the fairy tale wolf, tells Connie he can, quote, knock on her house and knock it down anytime he wants. While Perot explicitly told his audience that Red was devoured by the wolf, Oates leaves Connie's tragic fate to our imagination. It's pretty implied that she dies, though. It is impossible to overlook the fact that Oates wrote Where Are You Going, Where Have You Been the same year, 1966, as the song Little Red Riding Hood was written by Robert Blackwell and sung by Sam the Sham and the Pharaohs. What is uncanny is the blame put on the victim, Red. Furthermore, there is a return to the appetite of older men for adolescent girls, as Red is described in the lyrics to be, quote, a little, a li a little big girl, end quote. A delicacy, Red's apparent virginity is the trophy. You're everything a big bad wolf could want. This time, instead of cross-dressing as the grandmother, the wolf disguises himself by wearing a sheep suit, and again it is difficult to ignore Zipe's reading of the tale as one regarding rape. While the red of Perot and Oates falls victim to rape and murder in the spirit of the 1990s Generation X Riot Girls movement, red has been resurrected in the film's freeway and hard candy. Her world is modern, urban, even ghetto, and is brimming with pop culture icons. This red is the daughter of militant feminism and she comes with a specific mission, to prey upon her predator and avenge the wrongs done to her literary sisters. But this in itself is also an evolution and begins with Freeway. Freeway was released in 1996 and was a blatant retelling of Little Red Riding Hood. Written and directed by Matthew Bright, the film opens with a series of cartoon clips in which various reds are chased by a wolf. You can pass those around. The multiple reds alert the audience that the wolf is a serial killer. The red of Freeway goes by the name of Vanessa and is played by Reese Witherspoon. As Orenstein describes her, Vanessa is, quote, an illiterate Southern California white trash teenager who comes home from remedial reading class one day to find her mother hustling tricks on the corner and her hirsute her lupine stepfather smoking crack. So we see that idea of the slut and then the wolf again even in just where she comes from. The film is fast-paced and practically opens with the arrest of her mother. <clears throat> Vanessa escapes children's services and heads north to her grandmother's trailer in a stolen car. She wears a red leather jacket and carries the traditional basket, except there is a gun inside instead of bread and wine. Because she got the gun from her boyfriend Chopper Wood, it is expected that he will be the saving force, that is, until he dies almost immediately. The path is Interstate 5, which is being stalked by a prostitute-killing murderer, thus echoing Oates's story in two different ways. When Vanessa's stolen car overheats, she is forced to hitchhike and is picked up by the I-5 killer, also known as Bob Wolverton, played by Kiefer Sutherland. Red is a product of her environment. Vanessa has not been afforded the same luxuries or opportunities she might have had had she been born into a higher social class. This echoes the peasant origin of the original Red. Vanessa does not stray from the path so much as she attempts to create a better one for herself, despite the odds against her. She is street smart and knows how to take care of herself, but she is also a teenage girl looking for an adult to take care of her. The wolf, disguised this time as a child psychologist, pretends to be such an adult. He gets her to open up and talk about her hardships, telling her, quote, make no mistake about it, you are the victim. 
But when he attempts to kill her and she reverses the attack, Vanessa makes it very clear that she is refusing that role. As wolves howl and owls hoot in the background, somewhere off the interstate, Vanessa pulls her gun on her assailant and shoots him multiple times. What should have killed him, however, does not, and disfigured, he now becomes on the outside the monster that he always was on the inside. Yet the courts do not see it that way. Instead, they see a respectable citizen, an authority figure even, and husband with a supportive wife, played by Brooke Shields. <laughs> Wolverton is from a high status class, whereas Vanessa is not, so she is the one that is arrested. And during her incarceration, her transformation into predator occurs. A psychological report created while she is in detention describes Vanessa as having an antisocial personality disorder because she shuns all human contact. She is taking on the characteristics of the wolf. Using a lighter to melt down and reshape a toothbrush, Vanessa makes a shank and escapes. Now clad in a red miniskirt, she continues on her way to the grandmother's house. But the wolf gets there first to rape and kill the matriarch. Vanessa enters the trailer to find Wolverton in her grandmother's bed wearing her grandmother's clothes. You're gonna have to pardon my French again. Some big ugly fucking teeth you have, Bob, she says, <laughs> before she takes the upper hand. It is not clear whether or not Vanessa kills Wolverton, but what is clear is that Freeway provides a chance to recap the tale's stock characters and themes and to re-examine the laws by which they survive and adapt. More than a celebration of girls, this film is a celebration of girl power. Vanessa, as an avatar of Red, is refusing to accept the role of victim society has handed her. However radical this Red is, she is acting in self-defense, whereas the final Red to be examined is the predator from the start. <coughs> In the 2005 film Hard Candy, Red is a 14-year-old girl named Haley Stark, played by Ellen Page. While the writer, director, and producer claim that the similarity of the plot to Little Red Riding Hood was not deliberate, <laughs> the unfolding of each motif is uncanny, and therefore can only be explained by the Jungian theory of the collective unconscious. After all, Haley wears a red hooded sweatshirt, is a young girl being stalked by an older man who she also entertains with a striptease at one point, among other parallels to be discussed. What sets her apart from other reds is the lack of a grandmother figure. One might conclude, though, that this red is so advanced she does not need one. She's therefore gone rogue. Hard Candy is filmed almost entirely in one location, mostly a house within a very wooded upscale neighborhood, possibly the Hollywood Hills. Many of the climactic scenes feature Haley backdropped by a red wall. Slade said that the color play was intended to heighten mood and play off character. The film opens using a computer screen to relate an instant messaging dialogue between Haley and the would-be wolf, a pedophile by the name of Jeb Culver, played by Patrick Wilson. To return to the idea of the riot girl influence on both Freeway and Hard Candy is the fact that Haley's username is thonggirl14. The thong is her bait, the number her age, and the rest is her premeditated revenge. The audience experiences a mother's worst nightmare during this scene, believing that this young, naive girl has just been baited by a murderous pedophile. The idea is further reinforced when the two first meet in a coffee shop and the camera lens zooms in on a flyer in the background for a missing girl. Then the to make matters worse, Haley agrees to go home with him, and the camera pans on the two of them in a car, driving a windy road, another path seemingly headed to her demise. But then the rules begin to reverse. Haley drugs him, and not the other way around. Her premeditation becomes more clear when he comes to, and she informs him that no one will hear him scream, because she has done her research too. She knows that one neighbor is at work, and the other is vacationing. At this point, Jeff is falling into the role of the victim. 
When she points out that he had taken his time, quote, sniffing someone out her age, end quote, not only do we recognize the wolf in him, but the incredible danger she could be facing, as she has also found evidence directly linking him to the disappearance of the girl in the missing poster, who was not only molested in a snuff film, but murdered. The theme of Men Archie is brought up again when Haley asks, quote, what makes a girl who's barely passed her first period worth all this research, end quote. Then Haley addresses the age-old dilemma of Little Red Riding Hood by simply stating, quote, just because a girl knows how to imitate a woman does not mean she's ready to do what a woman does, end quote. Haley has covered her tracks and is intent on Jeff's suffering. She leads him to believe he is baiting her when it is the other way around. She tortures him by not only castrating him, but by setting up a video camera so he is forced to watch the procedure. Finally, the Freudian reading of the tale, in which the red cap is supposed to represent the male fear of castration, sort of makes sense. However, this is not enough for Haley, and through the never-ending cleverness of her trap, she has devised his end, while clearing herself simultaneously of any crime committed, including murder. She convinces him that she will destroy all the evidence of his pedophilia and or involvement in the snuff film if he commits suicide, but she is deceiving him again. As she watches him jump from the roof, the noose around his neck links back to the grandmother's tail and the rope that the wolf tied around Red's ankle when she went outside. This time, it is around him, just as the rules were reversed during his castration when he is literally emasculated. It is unclear who exactly Haley is. She may or may not be who he thought she was or who she said she was. She may or may not be the honor student of a doctor, as she claims, but one thing is clear. As she tells her would-be predator, she is, quote, every little girl you ever watched, touched, hurt, screwed, or killed. As this red, Haley, flees the crime scene, scrambling down a wooded hill in her red hooded sweatshirt, one cannot help but wonder where she will go from here. So that concludes the lecture part. <laughs> Whoa. Fascinating. Yeah. Um, so, as I said before, there are a few, I used um, Little Red Riding Hood loosely in my, my own novel fig um, as a loose frame. It centers around um, a girl, her mother, and then a grandmother, who in this case is actually not... Um, it's not her maternal grandmother, but her paternal grandmother instead. Mm -hmm. And I used other motifs. Um, for people who aren't familiar, it's about a girl showing, growing up under the shadow of her mother's schizophrenia on a farm in rural Kansas, and it's told over a period of 13 years. So one of the things that I did look at was um, the trauma of a C-section, especially for women who don't want to end up having to have a C-section. I had had my daughter at home and it was an ecstatic birth experience, but I had a couple of friends who were transported and it was a really complex trauma for them to experience because while they had this baby that was living and thriving, mm -hmm. they had also had sort of all their power taken away. One of them had been abandoned by her midwife at the hospital too, so it was just further oh, more painful. But everybody sort of wondered like, why are you so sad the baby's alive? Mm -hmm. um, so that is one of the things that sort of undoes Fig's mother's schizophrenia to some extent. So this is a very short section from the book that kind of covers that. Adam and Eve get stuck in my head. Like Eve, I was cut out, emergency cesarean, seven years ago, come next week. Daddy says it's just another creation myth. Don't believe everything you hear, he says. Your birth has a story, too. And this is what I've been told. Mama and Daddy meet in college, fall in love, and are married, just the two of them at the courthouse, both in blue jeans. They decide to leave the rat race behind and come to Kansas, to the family farm where Daddy grew up. 
They began the long process of converting the farm to all organic, and I'm conceived. Daddy tells Mama that she glows. Mama joins a home birth group because she wants to have me all natural. She picks out a midwife and begins to grow me while Daddy plants corn and sweet potatoes. Mama starts a sunflower patch, tall and yellow. She plants herbs in one garden and flowers in yet another. I grow bigger and bigger and take up all of Mama. When I'm supposed to turn like all babies do, there isn't any room, and Mama has no doubt I'll either turn when the time comes or she'll just have to push me into life backward. Mama nests. The other women in her group have babies one by one all at home. One woman gives birth outside at sunrise and another delivers the baby right into her husband's hands. They all describe childbirth as empowering. Empowering. Mama's contractions come fast and hard. She always says it felt like I was being split in half. The midwife comes but refuses to do the home birth. Mama must be taken to the hospital and this is called transport. Mama agrees to go, but she can't stop crying. She tells them she can do it, deliver me breach, but the nurses and doctors all ignore her, prepping for surgery instead. Just as God put Adam to sleep, the anesthesiologist does the same to Mama, and I am born from a dream like I'm not real. So the other, there are moments where Little Red Riding Hood is directly addressed in the book, as in this brief section where you start to see the mother's um, disease unraveling more. I'm in the third grade and we're supposed to choose a fairy tale and make our own book at home. Mama is excited. I don't tell her I want to do Rapunzel because she's already decided on Little Red Riding Hood. My mother took a multimedia art class when she was an undergraduate at Cornell before she met Daddy, and this is where she learned to make pop-up books. She thinks it'll be fun to make one for the assignment and laughs. You'll be the only kid who does, she says, as if this was a good thing. Mama buys tubes of paint, an X-Acto knife, and two variety packs of Sharpies from the Hobby Lobby in Topeka. Not just black, but all the colors of the rainbow. One set of regular markers and one set of fine tip, and she buys two new scissors, a pair for me and a pair for her. Back home, before we begin, she takes all the cereal outside. She dumps each box, opened or unopened, into the yard and laughs. The crows daddy tries to keep away with faceless straw men come and for days will peck the dead grass for cornflakes and Cheerios. My scissors are meant for paper, but mama's are for cloth. They're expensive, stainless steel, the shine is dangerous. She does most of the cutting because my scissors don't make it through the thin cereal box cardboard. I make the axe for the woodcutter. I use a toothpick for the handle and a scrap of cardboard for the blade. It starts out silver, but Mama says, add more red. I use a red paint pen, and it's leaky, hard to control. Mama forgets to have us write anything, but the pictures say enough. There is red paint all over the kitchen table, all over me, and on Mama too. Daddy comes in for dinner and studies Mama's face. She talks to him in a shrill voice that doesn't sound like Mama. Daddy takes Mama into the guest bedroom that is also Daddy's office and where he sleeps these days, and I am left alone with my dinner. The spaghetti is from the night before, still cold. Instead of eating, I carefully separate the red-soaked pages and I don't tear a single one. The woods pop up, then the wolf, the house, the grandmother herself, and finally the woodcutter, his axe springing upward. I look at the wolf's belly, the damage already done, and little Red's head poking out from the slit that Mama made. I can hear them through the heating vent in the floor, their voices tinny. Daddy says, you have to try to let go. A pause. Are you having any of those other thoughts? Mama yells at him. She says she's perfectly fine. Then she says she's stifled. She says it like it's Daddy's fault. And then I hear the sound of Mama leaving. The front door slams and then her Volvo spits out gravel because she's driving too fast on the driveway. Little Red Riding Hood looks at me. Because she's made from cardboard, her neck is stiff. Why did you cut me out, she says. I didn't want to be saved. I study Little Red Riding Hood. I think about telling her, I didn't ask to be born, but I don't. I don't say anything. So the father, he's, he's a woodworker, but he's had to put it to the side in order to take care <coughs> of the mother. So that was another motif that I carried through. And then this is a super short um, to explain, there's this 
canine creature lurking on the periphery of the book um, and whether or not it's real is never exactly answered and whether or not it's more than one canine creature. <coughs> so winter turns to spring and I see the feral dog walking the borders of our land. Crepuscular, she comes at dawn or dusk only and I have no evidence to prove she is female or to know she is a dog and not wolf or coyote or dingo and yet I do know. She always emerges from the woods along the ditch before she dares the open horizon of Kansas flatness. And because it's just before the sun has risen or set all the way, she is nothing more than a shadow against the canvas onto which she paint chooses to paint herself. She takes her time. She wants to make sure I see her. I watch from windows or from the porch, and sometimes I watch from the heart of the orchard, mm -hmm. from my perch in the apple tree in the row farthest from the house. She appears and disappears at the same gate of wild raspberry that curtains the ditch, and she always walks a full circle around the house. She tells time. Like the hands of a clock, she begins where she ends and ends where she began. So when I wrote that she's nothing more than a shadow against the canvas onto which she chooses to paint herself. The mother was also an artist, um, and that's probably the most painful part about watching her come undone in the book is how she no longer, because of medication, she just no longer can create art anymore. Um, and so in that way, she loses herself over time. So those are just a few of the ways that I sort of incorporated all of my research yeah. from that into the book. <clears throat> yeah. Was that an intention all along when you wrote your thesis that you would create a book out of it? or I, I did write them. Well, I wrote this short story that would become Fig um, at the same time that I was writing the critical thesis. And then I, I knew that I always wanted to have components come into the short story. And the short story won a lot of awards and was receiving a lot of attention in literary journals and mm -hmm. an agent came out of the woodwork and asked if I had a book um, that she could see so I did what my teacher at the time who was Bobby Louise Hawkins told me <laughs> and I lied and I said absolutely I have a book and I asked for six weeks and I wrote as fast as I could and I shudder to imagine what I gave that woman. Um, long story short, she gave me a chance to work on it more. More agents came. Um, the original agent and the second agent who approached me, they ended up passing on the book and breaking my heart a little bit. And then another agent came and, and, and that's how that ended up. But yeah, I'm not very good at plot, so I liked the basic <laughs> idea of taking a plot that already is mm -hmm. to some so extent. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Six weeks. It was yeah. I like I won't even look <laughs> at that particular document because it must have been. I mean, I don't think it was like a full book, and <laughs> it was just I was pretending that it was a book. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting what you can do under pressure. Yeah. Well, and I didn't really, I don't think I even quite understood what the role of an agent did at that point. I, I don't even know if I really understood why I was submitting stories to contests or to journals other than I wanted to get published, but of course that's where agents look. Um, and so, yeah, I guess it was fate or something like that. How is it today with so much um, self-publishing and then be working with an agent? How... Well, the only it? way that you pretty much can get published by the big five publishing okay. houses is if you have an agent. Um, right. They don't, they won't look at any other work. And really, I think the agent has replaced the older relationship between a steady editor and a writer. Um, so, for example, my agent, we do a lot of editorial work together before right. we even try to sell a book. Right. Um where it used to be that you would sell it and then the editor would do most of the work. Like I did a few minor revisions with my editor at Simon & Schuster, but, yeah. but not a lot. It was really, I think I revised the book for about a year with Heather, my agent, Helping before we sent that, it out. Yeah. Through the course you took at the university, 
do they have connections? Does the university have connections with Bible agents? Naropa does not. No, I'm sorry. Naropa does not. Naropa has a much bigger focus on like the outrider lineage and small press publication. Um, so I think that was partly why I didn't really know what I was doing, uh, other than having grown up in a bookstore that helped a little bit. But even <laughs> even yeah. that had changed since the time that my parents had been running the store. For what I know, for people who have gone to MFA programs at other schools, for the most part, generally speaking, the agents that represent their professors end up representing their student work, mm -hmm. which is one perk to go to those types of schools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a different way of activating that literary lineage, because mm -hmm. um, my experience of lineage at Naropa is, like you were saying, that outrider. So it's kind of like your lineage is in this rebellion kind of bucking the system, which can be really beautiful and I think it makes really great like what I do in the writing community now is I do reading series and workshops and stuff like that. So I, I feel like I got that skill set from that lineage, but I do not have the language of agents or publishing houses or anything like that. So it's interesting kind of the, the different cultures that emerge. Um, my question has to do with taking and ascribing meaning. And I... I personally often have, not a problem, but questions about people ascribing meaning to an artwork that <laughs> the artist may or may not have entertained at all. And I, I <laughs> wonder, um, you know, because I've seen from the other side, knowing many, many artists and being somewhat of an artist myself, but that people will say, oh, you must clearly you this and this and this and this. And it's mm -hmm. like, no, I just really thought that blue and that yellow looked <laughs> nice <laughs> next to one another. Mm -hmm. So like in listening, which I found fascinating, but I think it tells as much or more about the people layering the meaning on than necessarily and the mm -hmm. the and uh, you know there's a certain point and I'm not talking specifically about you where it's really amusing I read an article it's been a while ago but by a very very famous conceptual artist in you know maybe he was the 90s or 2000s and he would just totally at the very last minute before one of his you know happenings just pull something out of thin air and then you know part of the entertainment for him was watching people pile all this mm -hmm. you know Meaning. yeah Meaning. and conceptual artists love doing that. yeah um but the other thing and just um i think and it's been interesting now with you know all the talk about pedophilia, which clearly is very real and stuff, but I, I think we often forget that for most of human history, older men with very young girls, as soon as they hit menstruation, that has, that has been the norm for evolutionary history, not only with so humans. With the pedophilia in particular, when you're looking at the origins of when the grandmother's tale is first told. You know, during the Inquisition, women were being accused of witchcraft and men were being accused of werewolf, being werewolves. And so one of the things that they were typically accused of was molesting small children of all genders, which is, you know, and I, I that was one of the <laughs> things where I was really, really like, careful three or more motifs. Like it has to have three or more motifs. And and I wouldn't look at things that didn't have mm -hmm. those motifs, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. And so with like the with hard candy, I mean it's really hard to deny. <laughs> um, I mean she's even in a trap. And and it, cinematically when they are driving up the path. <laughs> 
there's something going on with it, the, the language, mm -hmm. and whether or not they intended it, right. I think that's where the Jungian right. psychology comes in. Right. But again, the motifs need to... But then the thing that's tricky with the motifs is that they change right. over time. You know, she wasn't wearing a red cloak in the first version. There is some evidence that there was a Latin version before it, about three centuries beforehand, where there was a girl who lived with wolves who wore red. Um, you know, but that's become a motif, even though it wasn't in the original one. So being able to track that sort of history, I think, is important. But in the Middle Ages, probably the, you know, the, and, you know, who knows, there probably on a certain level was no age of consent. Yeah. But, you know, it probably was 13, 14, maybe even younger. So that would have had to been, you know, as you said, very young mm -hmm. children. And, yeah, and then I think that other thing that is important to note is that Charles Pro was really upset with what was happening in the literary salons at Versailles. Um, you know, women in particular were sort of acting out fairy tales, which was how it became more bourgeois and why you started to record them. And those same women had secret doors that led into their bedchambers and they were just sleeping with whoever and, and he didn't like that at all. And so there there's a lot of evidence that he specifically ascribed the moral to that folk, that his version to scandalize the women that he disapproved of in that particular changing culture. Yeah. I have to sneak away, girl. I'm so happy to see you. I'm happy to see you too. I, excuse me. Oh, it's okay. I understand. I love this. It's so interesting the way you did that. Thank you for coming. Thank Also, the, the point of viewers or audience members or readers ascribing a lot of meaning that isn't originally intended by the artist. I'm interested in that. I feel like I've talked about this in the writer's table discussions before, but I feel like a mark uh, between good art and great art is, um, like, good art is can be prescriptive. It knows what it wants to say. That's the only thing you get out of it. And if you get anything else, you're wrong. Like, I feel like that sometimes happens, but great art is evocative, which means that you can, there, there are exponential ways to interpret it. Um, so I think that if a piece of writing or performance or visual art evokes something that is greater than the artist's original intent, I think that's a, that's a mark of greatness in the work. Because um, it, it can surprise itself. Um, and I know that that's something that I always love in terms of workshops or collaborations or any time that I put my work into the world, is if someone comes to me with an interpretation that I didn't even fathom when I was putting pen to paper, that's like the best moment. <laughs> yeah. I, where you, you're like, I'm smarter than I actually thought that I was because I, I did do that, you know, because in the interview with the director of Hard Candy, you know, they talk about how they now realize how many of the motifs right. were slipping in. I think you have to be, you know, everybody thinks that this is autobiographical and that's something that kind of gets old a little bit, especially yeah. when I'll literally be in a panel and I've used the word fiction like five times to describe <laughs> it, or I've talked about the fact that this isn't about me and then I'll have somebody ask me, but honey, was there like a caseworker who came and helped you out? It happens all the time, yeah, so. definitely, and I think that that's also something between writers and people who don't identify as writers or don't necessarily have that practice in their life is not it's a, it's a very weird thing that artists do to get to this intense vulnerability that actually is not their life narrative um it's a, mm -hmm. it's a really strange thing i experienced that when i was in high school i wrote actually a flash fiction piece about um a woman being raped in a Piggly Wiggly grocery store. Like, where the hell did that come from? That never happened to me, I didn't know anyone, but it like felt like a really important story to tell and that character asserted itself. Um, I won a contest, read the story, and then there was a flood of like, my parents were getting calls from people of, is your daughter okay? And like, all of that kind of stuff. And it's it's really interesting because I think it's a, it's a strange kind of communication. Um, I also think it happens a lot more with 
female writers. Yeah. Um, when I was, because I write in first person a lot, I tend to write a lot of mother-daughter relationships. And when I was sending work out to literary journals in the beginning, I was, you know, I'm pretty nitpicky about things and I knew who I was submitting to and what they took. And again and again, I was getting on the standard rejection slips that they give you, you know, they're tiny because they want to save paper. I was getting handwritten notes from male editors telling me that they don't publish memoir again and again oh, when I was yeah. sending fiction. And so, mm -hmm. you know, there, I think there is this idea that somehow women only write memoir, not that there's anything wrong with memoir. Um, but it was interesting when I started submitting the same work to contests that were judged blind. That was when I started getting published. Yeah. Interesting. Mm. I love what you said, Ellie, putting a different spin on it and in, the, in that <clears throat> nobody's wrong if you've done something whether in any artist art form. Mm -hmm. No one's wrong when they see something in it. It's actually, uh, we should take it as a compliment mm -hmm. and that it's bigger than we thought it was. And I, I really, I like that a lot. Kind of that so, invitation. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Sarah, is it, <clears throat> is it inhibiting then to a writer, especially someone like you who lives in the town you grew up and so people are likely to know people you went to high school with or your parents or whatnot. Are you consciously aware when you're writing of making sure to disguise stories or...? Well, again, it is really all pure fiction. I didn't grow up in Kansas. My mom isn't schizophrenic. But knowing how people are going to maybe take it? What I've found is that I can write the most fictional story ever and people are going to find themselves in it and think that it's about them when it wasn't. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I guess in a way I take that sort of as a compliment and that I'm getting the human experience right to some extent. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think what has been interesting is how sometimes they, they're marketing it as historical fiction. Um, <laughs> historical fiction? Is that what they, you they, said? They've tried to market it that way, um, which it's not. I believe that the author couldn't have been alive at the time period that it was written. But it, like on Goodreads, it's under a historical fiction list. And so strange. So um, it is really strange. You know, it's, it's definitely pre technology, and maybe just that difference alone with the millennials is enough for them to think that it's prehistoric, I don't know. Historical. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think that, I think every writer runs into that problem. It was interesting when I was doing one of the Jaipur Literary Festival, the stories on stage, and Erica Krauss and I were doing like a Q&A afterwards, and she introduced me to this theory called the cohesive narrative, um, which one of my writing teachers sort of talked about it when he called it emotional truths, like what emotional truths come up in your writing. And so a cohesive narrative is a therapeutic term where in order to heal from a trauma, you need to tell the story, but it's not necessarily going to be actually what happened to you, um, perhaps because it's too traumatic to actually do the, the precise details. And I was thinking a lot about that afterwards and the fact that, you know, when I started writing Fig, my mom was alive. As I was working on it, she was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, and then she died before I finished it, mm -hmm. since pancreatic cancer is you know, um, and that in a lot of ways this is a book about me losing my mother, but then it's, a, you know, also not at all a book about me losing my mother. Mm -hmm. I think I'm interested in that cohesive narrative quite a bit, mm -hmm. and, and how were things like fairy tales and myths cohesive narratives, you know, there's so much metaphor going on with all of them. I mean, I have issues with what Freud ascribed to fairy tales in particular, you know, um, the whole like idea that the hood is supposed to be the vagina dundata just is pretty absurd to me considering that she's the one that gets eaten um and i think that's where i, I do think you have to be careful to, that you're 
you make sense with what your thesis statements are and your analysis, you know, that you're not assigning your own agenda on anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I usually call them fraud. <laughs> Exactly. And Angela Carter, Angela Carter was very, very Freud obsessed and opposed to Freud. And so in all of her retellings of fairy tales, she was sort of like deliberately messing with Freud for sure. Yeah. I mean, so, well, a couple things. One, um, when I taught ceramics and I would have students do you know, a male figure or a female figure, it was astonishing. And, you know, I would say, did you set out to do a self-portrait? Oh, no. And, you know, you would look, it's like, it's exactly mm -hmm. them. And I think no matter what we produce, it's imbued with us. Absolutely. There's no way it mm -hmm. can't be. And similarly, you mm -hmm. know, as we know from you know, crime situations, you know, eyewitnesses are horribly bad, um, you know, they're horribly unreliable because even if we watch the exact same thing, all of us are going to tell a different version. We're even going to literally see it differently. It's, yeah. 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 They're so not, they're not, it's not that they're horribly unreliable. It's just that they're all different. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, yeah, and I think any, you know, I'm anti-category in every way because I think you, oh, you know, we're all so complex and, you know, all of that. So, you know, yeah, I just, it's like, no, there's no, you know, Things aren't as clear anyway. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that I didn't express that very well. But. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions about anything? So I would assume you have another, do you have another, what are you doing now? <laughs> I love that question right now. You got so excited. <laughs> um, well, I'm teaching a lot um, and trying to survive living in Boulder County um, <laughs> on that income, which um, means that I'm teaching a lot. Um, I am working on my second novel. I'm on the fifth version. Wow. Um, and it's pretty different. Each version is pretty different. It took me a long time to sort of get her voice out of my head. Um, but it, it's a novel called Roadside Altars, and it's about a girl named Crystal Rassett who she was born with a lump on her left shoulder that is the, it's what's, it's the remains of what's known as vanishing twin syndrome. Um, and so there's bits and pieces of her dead sister in her shoulder. Um, and she wow. <laughs> hears her sister. So it's really playing with shadow self quite a bit is, yeah. is what I'm getting at with that. And then she comes from a long line of fortune tellers and hoodoo practitioners. And she goes on a road trip and each chapter is a different tarot card from the major arcana as the fool goes through the 22 cards. Um, yeah. Wow. That's, that's the premise of that book. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely taking... I mean, I think Fig took me ultimately a total of like four or five years to get to where it is now. I think I'm a slow writer. That's my answer to that. Yeah. But you said five, you've written this new one five times. Is that what you... Did you mean that? I did, yes. I'm, in, I'm on the f fifth version right now, so I haven't written five different versions of the novel, but I'm starting on the fifth version right now. And how many, wh where are you chapter-wise? or With the fifth version, I'm somewhere in the first chapter right now. Um, okay. Each one has been approximately like three to four hundred pages. Oh my god. I've switched point of view a few times, I've mm -hmm. switched tenses a few times. I started with third person and then I went to first person and now I'm back to third person. Oh, wow. Um, 
So, you know, it's all pre-writing. I think I cut something like 300 pages ultimately from this too at one point. So I think I'm a really messy all over the place. Some people write with outlines and you use particular types of programs and I'm more messy than that. I didn't, you know, writing a novel is really hard and um, graduate school, at least my our particular graduate school didn't really like I couldn't even turn in my whole novel for my thesis. I had to turn in 120 pages of it. It's so tiny. It's so <laughs> tiny and it's really kind of ridiculous compared to other programs. Yeah. Um, and then the, it, our critical thesis was a 30 page minimum when most critical theses are like yeah. 90 pages. I, that, I remember when I saw that requirement. I almost laughed out loud because I because I did a thesis I did two theses actually in my undergrad programs each of those were 100 pages each and then my master's program I had to write a 30 page paper I was like I knew that in like a day. Technically, <laughs> this was my yeah. undergrad degree and I was with Reed By and he let me write a nice. close to 50 page critical mm -hmm. and then and then with the grad school they were they were very adamant that it was and that was 50 pages. 1.5 spaced too, right. so it was actually more. Reed was very nice to let me do that <laughs> because I don't know how you're supposed to write a thesis in that amount of time. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. like an essay. I have to go too. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank yeah, you for coming. Yeah. I'm interested. So it sounds like the, the piece that you're working on right now has, it almost sounds like a writing exercise because it has a lot of formal constraints. Did you have a similar process with Fig, or was Fig more generative, or like, or, or if you did have those constraints for Fig, what were they? I knew that it had to be told in present tense, mm -hmm. first person, and that it was going to cover as much of her life as I as it could and that it would end at the age of 19 because that's when women most commonly start to exhibit symptoms of schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. So she's worried that she's going to inherit the disease. So those were always constraints in the first agent that had been interested. She wanted it to not be in, in uh, present tense. She wanted it to be more of like a flashback novel. And there is a tiny frame at the beginning, um, really, really small. But I, and it's implied that the present tense is a looking back, but I didn't feel like I could convey the right amount of trauma right. with past, trend, past tense yeah. as I could with present. It offers an out. I think mean, past tense like is a, is a really easy kind of exit latch, whereas if you're in present tense, your reader can't, like, has to be in that moment with you. And, it, and she's such an unreliable narrator, and she has to be an unreliable narrator mm -hmm. because really it's a portrait of her mother more than it is even of her she's just the lens through but and i you know i had thought about trying to do scenes from the mother's point of view and i just i don't know if i'm that skilled to be able to write from the point of view of somebody who is delusional or is losing their mind or over medicated um without it just seeming ridiculous i guess or discounting the disease or the people who have it yeah yeah